Welcome to the Predictive World series brought to you by SalesChoice, a company that specializes in ending revenue uncertainty for human advantage. I'm your host, Jen Yim. I'm the Director of Product and Marketing here at SalesChoice, and we bring three offerings to market. First is Sales Insights, which helps sales professionals meet their sales plans and with guided insights. Uh, then there's Mood Insights, which helps frontline employees versus be, um, be heard, and it's all powered by AI. And our third offering is Data Science as a Service, designing and building and maintaining AI models with a new line of business on generative AI. Over the years, we've been hosting um, numerous experts and thought leaders from all sorts of uh, companies related to AI and revenue growth, uh, building a trove of podcasts, webinars, and white papers and more. And I invite you to go to saleschoice.com slash resources, where you can find all of those amazing materials. Uh, today, I have with us Alex Elias, CEO and founder of Clue. Alex, uh, welcome and, and pleasure to meet you. Um, could Thank you. you. Tell it's us a pleasure to be here with you. Awesome. Yeah. And I uh, can't wait to, to hear more about uh, your, your history. It's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to jump right in. Um, so yeah, I'm Alex. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Clue. Um, this has been a long journey. So we started the, the company over a decade ago with kind of an academic uh, premise. Uh, the idea at the time was that there was a lot of recommendation engines and undergirding so many new consumer services, uh, be it Netflix, uh, Spotify, and the music world. Uh, and we basically saw that there was a need to kind of bring a more holistic understanding of taste uh, to market uh, for the purposes of making better inferences and predictions. Uh, so that's what started that journey. Uh, we originally had a consumer facing premise. We felt that people needed to be empowered with kind of more nuanced uh, recommendation engines and science. Uh, and over the years, we realized that there was a much bigger opportunity uh, to bring this to developers and empower developers. And so we uh, kind of embarked on that journey and some of our earliest clients were massive kind of social media networks and, and others that uh, realized the power of having this kind of uh, ability to generate predictions across different cultural categories. Um, but yeah, the journey really began even earlier. I'm a huge uh, uh, fan of different cultural uh, categories. I played the saxophone. I love uh, mid-century Italian cinema. Uh, and I sort of realized that there was kind of a connection, some sort of nexus between our uh, aesthetic preferences across different categories. And so we kind of, we set out to really explore that and we couldn't have, we really couldn't have predicted, uh, the one thing we couldn't have predicted is how how big a space this would really become over the years. So uh, thrilled to be here. Um, my kind of professional background prior to starting Clue, I was actually doing my, my doctorate at NYU in law, uh, focusing heavily on internet privacy. So that's been something that's kind of uh, oh, wow. been, been part of our ethos since inception. So uh, doing empirical research on the efficacy of click wrap agreements and uh, studying things like the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights that became a precursor to GDPR and CCPA and some of the main kind of privacy regulations. So um, that that's given us an interesting uh, foothold in the market and really excited to be here with you. Wow, that's that's an incredible history. You've really covered a lot of ground. Uh, in my past life, I was a, a digital marketer, so Clue really sounds like like a like a dream come true. Um, awesome. I know you talked a lot about Clue um, in your own um, bio, but if if you have anything to add um, about the company. Yeah, so we uh, so basically Clue's set out to build kind of an unparalleled uh, amount of knowledge about. Uh, cultural categories. So really understanding the nuance of the worlds of music, uh, global taste in music and cinema, uh, in, in dining and so on, and making this all available as a single kind of corpus that's highly normalized, that's easy for developers to hook into. Uh, and ultimately, the, the goal is to really empower uh, companies to use this intelligence and make more nuanced products. Uh, and, and part of the Part of the, the reasoning there is that, you know, there's been a proliferation of media, a lot of fragmentations of tastes. They're becoming harder to predict. They're faster moving. Um, and there's some risk that a lot of the kind of algorithmic feeds that people are exposed to doesn't really recognize that kind of heterogeneity. It's all 
sort of uh, kind of converging towards the mainstream, if you will, which is the, the last thing that really should happen with the current distribution landscape and the idea of having access to everything, this kind of abundance. Um, so, so really, uh, one of our one of our main goals is to empower all kinds of products, whether it be everything from automakers to financial services to media companies that are leveraging Clue, um, to better kind of understand taste and also respect people's privacy. And so, th those have been kind of two of the main goals that we've commercialized over the past decade. Wow, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cindy Gordon to start off uh, the conversation. Thanks, Jan, and welcome, Alex. Um, my head's spinning, and uh, not just from a taste perspective, but the fact that you're looking at the complexity of all the different, um, you know, correlations that can drive a far more advanced predictive model. And, uh, you know, good on you, because we are very much, um, you know, uh, I don't almost call it, almost say, an aspect of a, of a snowflake, right? Where we're floating, but whatever we experience, it it, it may alter the shape as well. So that kind right. of knowledge is, is really, really powerful and, and really good to hear that you're looking at the efficacy side of data bias. So, um, you know, uh, it's obviously been a passion here, um, trying to help ensure that clients are building the right AI model structures. Um, and you've already learned the journey is never over. Um, you know, in this field, right? Because there's there's only further insights and your point about the speed is is so accurate and what may be the case today can shift, uh, you know, 30, 60, 90 days out, right? So companies have to be super agile with, you know, the outliers in many ways, right? Um, so obviously it's a passion of yours. Um, you know, you already gave us some context, um, Alex, in the sense of, uh, you know, the company and, and where it's at, but um, obviously earlier you were pioneering in taste. So just curious, what's the root of that? Um, you know, because the story to get got to this story, there was a story before. So um, was it just the eclectic interest? Was it meeting another co-founder? Um, but I'd like to hear a bit about more of the roots um, and the backgrounds of the other founders. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think what you said is very, uh, you, you put it so well that it, that it is like a, a snowflake that could be, you know, uh, shaped. Um, we've we've seen the kind of recursive nature of preference formation and the fact that, you know, people are highly influenced by their own preferences or ultimately influenced by what they're in some sense told to be influenced by. And so, uh, yeah, that was that was just uh, just wanted to call that out. I, I really like that analogy. But but yeah, this really began. It was it was a multitude of factors. Uh, I think if you look back to 2009, which is really when we began thinking about these themes, uh, that was a time we had just come out of the Netflix prize competition, which was a million dollar prize for who could improve the efficacy of their algorithms. Uh, at the time, mostly collaborative filtering algorithms, uh, which is a certain method of AI uh, that was mostly pertaining to DVD rating data. And they saw major uh, challenges with that. Uh, the New York Times called it the Napoleon Dynamite problem, where, you know, for particularly enigmatic, interesting films, it's very hard to find predictive pathways into them or out of them. And so uh, what we, you know, what I began to think about is these these systems you know, Pandora had the Music Genome Project at the time. There was a lot of kind of disparate efforts to, to build an understanding of cultural entities and taste. And I've always felt uh, that, you know, these different cultural domains don't exist in isolation. Um, I remember, you know, years ago when I first moved to New York, going to 11 Madison Park, it was the, the fanciest restaurant I'd been to at the time. And you know, I soon learned that the chef, I, I loved it and I loved the music and the soundscape. And I soon learned that the chef was a, was a huge jazz fan and had sort of a, a whole set of uh, kind of uh, quotes on the wall of the kitchen that were from Miles Davis. And, you know, it was just this kind of wonderful reminder that there's this cross pollination. Um, and, and so that was a very kind of academic impulse. Uh, but on a practical level, we started uh, when I started the business and my co-founder is uh, Jay Alger, who ran one of the biggest digital agencies uh, that scaled to over 400 people in the 90s uh, called Deep End. And he had major clients from kind of Time Warner to Estee Lauder kind of doing these major enterprise builds. And so, 
you know, when we first came together, I was kind of the nerd with this idea. Uh, and he, he was someone who immediately saw kind of a future where this could be something that's offered as a service. Uh, and, you know, we, we, uh, so, so yeah, we kind of joined forces and it was a yin and yang in terms of approach to how, how we think about it. Um, but, but it ultimately led to this kind of alchemy of uh, a company that, you know, long before the AI wave and even the privacy wave, we were able to kind of really establish a unique proprietary corpus. And, you know, I think some of the the things we'll discuss later, um, just around kind of the quality of data and so on, has been something that we've been working on for a very, very long time. Um, but, but yeah, that that's some of, some of the background. And uh, again, I think there's uh, there's just something so profound about kind of understanding a more holistic uh, human as far as uh, taste formation and so on. And, you know, to date, we're kind of one of the one of the only companies that's done this agnostic to inventory. So we don't actually distribute film and TV. We don't, you know, stream music. We don't sell books. All we, we we're an agnostic layer that's fully agnostic to inventory uh, and just seeks to really understand those those cultural categories for the benefit of uh, the commercial landscape and ultimately the consumer. So then where do you get your your data sources from? Obviously, um, because my mind's exploding uh, in the sense of all the multidimensionality uh, here, but obviously accessing data uh, from different global segments and uh, but thoughts on, on there of how you're getting access uh, to to data. Yeah, so we have we have a very wide uh, procurement of, of data. Um, there's uh, multiple layers to it. So the primary layer is really focused on entity level data or content based data. Um, th that kind of data basically is is uh, looking at highly structured metadata around sort of who a music artist is, who directed a film, what the attributes of a restaurant are. Um, those we procure from dozens of sources, many of which we license, uh, much of which is open source. Uh, so the entirety of the kind of Wikipedia, Wikidata corpus. Uh, and then a lot we build completely from scratch. Uh, something we've learned over the years is oftentimes, no matter how much compute you have or how sophisticated the AI is, you know, you need highly structured, intelligible data to begin with. And in certain key areas like fashion, for instance, that was very difficult to come by. Um, so we actually brought on uh, essentially uh, contractors from Parsons and FIT and various kind of knowledge uh, based institutions that were domain specific and had them kind of manually meta tag and annotate all the brands and designers in existence season by season, and then began to have models then pick that up and you know carry the torch, so to speak. Um, and then the the broader corpus comes from uh, one of the principal sources is our commercial relationship. So Clue has this kind of wonderful model where we have everything we purvey is fully anonymized uh, by design. So there's no sort of masked identity or any kind of it's purely there's no PII or personal identity data anywhere in, in that exchange. Um, what Clue receives from clients when they're making requests are these arrays of entities. Uh, and we have this very narrow learning right that's kind of a virtuous cycle where for all the billions of requests that come through our API, we have this explicit right to just learn the fact that certain named entities in our database. So an entity could be a music artist, it could be a film, it could be a, a merchant ID like a restaurant, um, but we just learn that they co-occur in some way. And so that that's essentially one of the main corpuses that we draw from. Uh, in addition to that, we uh, have some first party. We acquired a company called Taste Dive, which is a highly popular recommendation engine. I encourage everyone to use it. Uh, the minute you type in something like movies like X on Google and so on, it ends up being one of the top uh, results. Uh, you know, individual entities might have tens of thousands of opinions uh, expressed on them. And what was interesting about Taste Dive, so at the time we acquired them, they were based in Amsterdam. We actually took off all advertising from the platform uh, and we expanded the category coverage because we wanted um, to have uh, a more powerful consumer service. Uh, and so what Taste Dive does is it gives us a really interesting first party corpus that's anonymized when it goes into training. 
um, that shows us the relationship between different, there's a high level of symmetry uh, in that particular data set. So it gives us these, these coveted sort of joins between the worlds of tastes in music and tastes in books and so on. Um, and Taste Dive has its own API ecosystem, uh, which has is also fully anonymized, has no ability to ingest PII, uh, and has thousands of active keys and developers uh, building on that ecosystem. So um, it's a very diverse corpus. I think it sets us apart as an AI company. There's a lot of companies uh, that are obviously being started now uh, that are either that are throwing compute at certain data sets um, that are... Uh, I think one of the main differences with Clue is that we have a decade plus long history of assembling an ethical corpus um, and training on our own corpus. So it's a it's a very unique lens uh, and it's purpose built uh, for the purposes of kind of generating taste inferences. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, it strikes me. Uh, you know, it's hard not to envision business models, and I'm sure you've thought about this, but. Uh, the thought of taking what you've done into uh, uh, an open source cloud offering where the, you know, the continued ecosystem development, but also some of it, uh, you know, you retain because the opportunity here, you know, it, it's not just all the wonderful things you've done here, but it's also thinking about the other other data sets that are out there. Like you think about pharmaceutical and taste and, and medical conditions and taste, like there's such a wealth of knowledge uh, to create in this journey, right? Um, so absolutely I, I, uh, so yeah uh, on the right track um, the, the, the yeah it's hard for me not to just dive in but I'll, I'll try and stay focused it's, it's you got me all excited <laughs> um, but that's a good thing because I don't get excited all the time um, <laughs> I know you touched on that the um, what you have is you know the a history and, and a foundation of uh, efficacy and that's role model and I think we all know there's some new books coming out called this snake was the AI snake oil right because everybody's jumping on it and slapping on labels and yet the foundations and the key thing in AI that you've learned and we've learned is it's an iterative journey and you can't you know you add one algorithm and you realize there's gaps and you add another data set and, and that kind of depth in time uh, speaks volume because it's an iterative process and many people haven't understood that yet right um, absolutely if, when you look at the market who do you watch the most? Um, you know, because obviously there's other folks that are out there. Um, and obviously with what you've built, you're a good acquisition target, right? If I think about the food big brands, uh, how they could benefit, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, that those are, I love what you said about it being kind of a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, I think that is uh, not not frequently understood uh, in, in the current marketplace. Uh so yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think in terms of what we have an eye on, I mean, we're very interested um, in the foundational models, the language models. We see a huge expansion in our commercial surface area. So a lot of our existing clients are looking to incorporate language as an interface. Um, and there's a lot of emerging clients that are kind of new that are looking uh, to, to that uh, paradigm. Uh, and, and what dawned on us is, a, that language is now, it's its ultimately a new interface over data. Uh, and uh, that's very profound. It's like web or mobile, you know, language is a whole new interface and it's something we can address uh, quite well because that, you know, the language models depend on having highly structured uh, oracles and sources of truth. Uh, and so Clue in those contexts has been serving as kind of a taste AI and Oracle that uh, can easily be incorporated into a lot of those paradigms uh, and it imbues it with kind of a source of truth and constrains the inferential range uh, and makes it much more accurate. And so we've seen some of our existing clients that are looking to things like very uh, editorialized generative itinerary planning, for instance, but they need kind of a source of truth as to what someone's taste might be given very sparse inputs um, and so, so yeah, that's a space uh, just to that question that we're watching very closely and collaborating very closely with. Um, and there's certainly a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest from large companies uh, in, in our space and a lot of, you know, M&A beginning to happen, kind of notwithstanding the broader macroeconomic conditions. And, you know, we recently, um, so, so this is something that 
you know, we, we get a lot of interest uh, in, in that space. Uh, we're very heads down uh, on the commercial uh, roadmap and looking to expand uh, that flywheel of kind of ethical data acquisition and modeling and servicing more and more uh, interesting clients. Uh, we have a couple integrations rolling out this year that are seismic, that are, you know, expected to be billions of queries per month uh, in volume and empowering entirely new use cases. Um, but, but yeah, it is, uh, it, there, there certainly is a, uh, a lot going on in the space and we try and keep keep on top of it all and try and help support. One thing I've learned, I think there is also a kind of broad conception, not just what you articulated that, you know, that that there's uh that that it's kind of a sprint of some sort, but that also that it's a zero sum game. And I think that's a misconception because the the problem space that we're seeing in the cognitive ecosystem broadly uh, is that there's, uh, it's kind of a fractal. Uh, there's a lot of problems that emerge and the more advanced the AI gets, uh, in some ways, the more problem surface area it creates that's addressable. Uh, and that's something that excites us because frankly, a lot of these use cases, a lot of our commercial expansion this year are, are things, are, they're, they're integration cases that didn't exist even 24 months ago. And that's really exciting to us to have a major you know, major banks, for instance, uh, highly focused on generative AI and kind of leveraging, you know, Clue as a, as a taste oracle into those systems, or, you know, even automakers with kind of virtual concierge services that understand driver and passenger tastes in different cultural contexts and so on. These are, these are new use cases that, you know, essentially didn't exist. So far from being kind of a zero sum game, you know, we very much look to the commercial landscape of AI, both the fledgling companies, some of the very established foundational models uh, as kind of as, as partners, ultimately, we're very kind of passionate about that. Yeah, there's um, definitely a risk angle too, that I'm sure you can amplify out, right? Not just the risk to the existing clients business models, and their agility, right? Because you bring a harder edge to the speed that the evolution is. Is are the data sets made global now? Because I saw in some of the visuals of doing the research, you do have global data. But are you concent? Is there areas that you're just you know more concentrated with the quality data sets? Um, so, so yeah, it is fairly global. And part of the reason we, we sort of, you know, uh, if you'd asked us seven years ago, some of our engineers would have very, um, very readily said that we bit off more than we can chew. Um, but there was always a kind of strong conviction among our leadership that it was in incredibly important to focus on breadth. Um, and that would be a competitive advantage over time. And so even though in the early days, that seemed like it was a contrarian thing to do to not just focus on music the way a company like Echo Nest did, which was later acquired by Spotify and internalized, um, but, but focusing on all media as well as the transactional and geolocational nexus. And sort of as part of that, we realized very quickly that it was important to not just catalog Hollywood films, but also Bollywood, you know, and not just catalog uh, tastes and hospitality and travel domestically, but you know, internationally. And uh, so, so it took, it, it was, it led to a longer kind of gestational period in R&D and the models obviously cost a lot more to train and there was more difficulty in achieving tractability. But as we overcame major hurdles, that breadth has become one of our biggest competitive advantages. And so today we cover, we're very global in scale. Um, we have, uh, you know, if uh, we cover all of Europe, we have been big integrations throughout Europe, throughout Asia, uh, throughout the Middle East um, that are ultimately in this B2B2C context. So cons and consumers are essentially interacting with um, with with the, the fruits of Clue in that way. Um, and, and yeah, so it's been a very big focus for us. Yeah. Um, another question. I know it's not in our plan, <laughs> but it's an important question. Have you started to look at the engine of consumers feeding your algorithm? So you've got a real-time mechanism with actual identities of my own taste, like as an individual and a chance to be in the ecosystem based on opting in and, but also uh, thinking through the contribution, um, you know, because at the end of the day, the construct is only as good as you know, as the data. And if the speed right. of that data set's evolving so fast, you you need an intervention with real-time consumer data as part of the brand and the input. So 
uh, a, a right. your roadmap, but just curious of you know, how do you get everybody into, you know, this opportunity? Yeah, so we have, uh, there's a lot of adaptive feedback mechanisms we have with clients that don't actually require identity to be passed. So oftentimes, uh, clients that are directly integrated into our AI and API can make ad hoc requests, so new requests that in incorporate adaptive feedback and have certain parameters like negative uh, sentiment, for instance, uh, as well as different, uh, a whole bunch of different features and factors that uh, improve the results for them and ultimately uh, give us that that kind of adaptive feedback. And then uh, Taste Dive is very much uh, a live uh, kind of uh, corpus and panel of fully authenticated kind of cross-domain preference. And again, there's no advertising on the platform. There's no uh, interest in really identifying individuals. It's ultimately uh, the, the expression of taste uh, in an anonymized sense that Clue is, is, ha has access to and is very interested in. And so we do have uh, a very, uh, our, our models are generally online models. So they're trained continuously based on, on feedback. Um, and one thing I'll note is that that really makes Clue unique as a recommendation service uh, is that we're built on a, on a corpus of knowledge, a foundation of knowledge. So we have a very deep understanding of the conceptual relationships between entities. So it's not just a bunch of statistics essentially layered on top of, you know, text strings or nodes. It's actually uh, understanding the underlying interrelationship between micro genres of music and the complex influenced by and influenced nodes and where things essentially the DNA of all these cultural entities. And so something that has emerged from that foundation is we're not just modeling the sort of primary tastes that are more rapidly evolving. So we do have, and, and we have a lot of that, but tastes in restaurants, tastes in films and TV shows and music artists, they change fairly rapidly. Um, but the first derivative of taste, so kind of the, the underlying sort of micro genres and the things are far more consistent. And, and something that that foundation has allowed us to do is really uh, acutely model the kind of the first derivative of taste and have, which has given us this very durable kind of intelligence that also has the benefit of onboarding new things from a cold start. So Clue's able to pick up on the minute something is entered into the database of Taste Dive, for instance, as a new entity, or the minute a new film is in pre-production, you know, we can uniquely model tastes around things that where taste data doesn't even exist yet, just by knowing the constellation of kind of features and factors that that, that entity is about. Um, and tying it back to that 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 graph. So um, we're very much, uh, a lot of our clients have come to look for us for that kind of forward looking, you know, um, and we've also incorporated, so we have some new endpoints that are also modeling out um, the sort of delta, the change in velocity of, of affinity. So not just what's most correlated to something now, but how much more correlated is it now? How much more correlated is this taste now than it was a week ago? Um, for just more acute kind of uh, use cases on on the output side um, for our customers. So yeah, it's a great, great question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it, as you well know, this is just a, a fascinating uh, topic. And um, like I said earlier, I'm quite excited, but I, I know I need to kind of narrow down for the last few things before I get the ding dong from Jen. But um, <laughs> it's critical to always in these journeys is, because there's so many entrepreneurs at different stages of AI design, development, deployment. Um, but, you know, as you step back and you look over the, the period of this journey with building out your solution and offerings, what are the top three lessons that you can pass along in using AI specifically that you want to pass on? So we'll leave the latter question as an entrepreneur building a business, but just in terms of the field of AI, if there was kind of three takeaways, what would they be? One, two, three. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you, you know, in some ways you've touched on many of these um, already. Uh, and I, I would say the top, um, maybe number one, uh, is that data is everything. The quality of data is everything. So no matter how powerful the compute is or how advanced the model is, there's just no substitute for kind of highly clean structured data that's hydrated that is that that has the, you know having a real source of truth uh, and oftentimes ironically that could involve 
you know, the best AIs are highly dependent on a very manual effort that involves a very human process of kind of curation or annotation uh, and so on. And of course, the machines can augment that effort. Um, but so I would say number one is that data is everything. Uh, the old adage about garbage in, garbage out, or the the converse of that. Uh, I think the second would be that there's really, uh, there's no no one size fits all. Um, it's really important to parameterize uh, and offer tr uh, transparency into the models for any end users of an AI um, so that ultimately they can tune and adapt uh, and, and understand why certain results might be happening and be able to, so, so really focusing on, on parameterizing the, the, the models and offering some degree of transparency, even in settings where, you know, causal explanations are not possible. So a lot of kind of deep learning and neural networks are fundamentally black boxes, but that's not an excuse to hide behind because there's still ways to allow um, for end users of that to, to have some degree of understanding of how they're engaging with that you know, with that apparatus. Um, and then I think, you know, n number three is some themes we've already talked on that uh, I think, uh, I think focus matters. So having, uh, you know, having a, a degree of focus on domain specific, like Clue literally will train different pairwise models for every domain pairing. So music to music to restaurants and, you know, fashion to movies and all these different kind of taste domain pairings, literature to travel, they all have vastly different uh, kind of velocities of data, vastly different numbers of entities in the, in the vocabularies and so on. So, you know, there, there's dedicated focus to the nuances of every domain pairing and actually understanding the underlying um, data. Um, and then if I could add a fourth, it would probably be that, that, sort of that point about the fractal that it's, you know, it's opportunities abundant. It's not a zero sum game. And in some ways, the more powerful the AI, you know, systems get, even with open AI feeling, you know, these certain foundational models feeling like they've kind of gobbled the entirety of, you know, the human language. And so even those will create entirely new problem spaces that other AI firms are are kind of in a, in a position to address. Um, so, so those might be some of the top top lessons I've learned. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's hard not to add a fifth, uh, but we, you maybe want to sneak one in now near the end and that's fine. Um, <laughs> we have one takeaway as an entrepreneur because uh, business you learn as you go and obviously right. you had some pivots, right? In your journey. And now you've really concentrated on, you know, the big win. But what would you say is uh, really important to a CEO trying to build a business? It doesn't have to be in the AI field, but your your biggest learning, um, your biggest legacy. Yeah. Um, so again, I think themes that you've articulated well, but I, I think the biggest learning and takeaway is that it's a maze. Ultimately, it's like navigating a maze. And you look at, um, you, you know, it kind of comes back to the genesis of Clue and me playing, you know, playing saxophone, playing jazz, uh, piano to a lesser extent, but but with with jazz music, it's an inherently improvisational form. So you have you have some sense of the structure of a composition in most settings. In a very avant garde setting, you might have no guardrails, but you have some sense of the structure of a composition. But then you have to adapt to that and adapt to other musicians and so on. And it's a very adapt. It's a highly adaptive journey where you really have to dispel yourself of any notion that you are going to control the outcomes and you have to sort of be very present and and willing to adapt and incorporate feedback in real time. Uh, and I think that's vastly different from like a philharmonic setting where you have a conductor and everyone has a music transcription and they're trying to basically play a composition as faithfully as possible. There might be different interpretive range, but it's ultimately about being, and that's kind of what a most very large companies and large enterprises are more like a philharmonic setting, you know, and I think, I think being an entrepreneur is a lot, uh, at least an effective one is a lot more like being a jazz musician. And if you try and apply the philharmonic sort of attitude uh, towards, uh, towards being an entrepreneur, it's going to be a big, it's going to be a, a challenge uh, because uh, there's so many unforeseen roadmaps and, you know, the cards to some extent are stacked against you. So your real advantage is in that, uh, in that ability to adapt quickly and improvise, which, you know, larger ships don't, don't really have. So 
Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, just to try to summarize what you've just said so eloquently, what a wonderful metaphor. It's all about the beat. Right, exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Alexander. Really appreciate you joining us today. I'm going to pass things over to, to Jen and uh, just delighted to have you with us today. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah, and again, thanks, Alex. It's fascinating history for both your, your personal self as, as well as your company. Um, glad we were able to chat and, and connect on AI together. Um, and thanks to everyone else for joining us for the Predictive uh, World Series uh, by Sales Choice. Uh, I just want to invite our listeners again to join us at saleschoice.com slash resources. We've got a trove of AI and thought leadership content across many years. And join us next time for more insights.